So on that note, I will wrap up and take any questions from you guys. Megan, thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. We've had lots of questions coming in. Um, so if I just um, stop you sharing, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, right, lots of questions and some of them are kind of more myth busting. So I think I might do some of those quick fire ones yeah. and then one to the big ones. So um, first of all, Tanya asked, really interesting, thank you. She says, people often say they find meat hard to digest. Do you think that's a myth or is there some truth in that? Yeah, look, we know um, that if people haven't had meat for a long time, we know that meat takes a little bit longer. So high protein foods essentially sit in the stomach for a little bit longer and therefore it might create kind of a feeling of fullness for longer because unlike, you know, a lot of carbohydrates, which get, get digested uh, faster, the meat can kind of sit in the tummy for a little bit longer. But again, it's not a case of then you, you've got an intolerance to meat or it doesn't work for you. Um, you know, it's a case of, you know, if you start to include small amounts over time, looking at your portion, then actually, you know, you will be able to tolerate it. But hey, at the end of the day, we know that having loads of meat is not great. Um, so usually if people are having, you know, a 80 gram portion of meat, they don't experience that feeling. Um, and they're also like, um, uh, the person who asked the question highlighted there is also this it's called a nocebo effect uh, where people it's the opposite to a placebo effect so if you think something's bad for you uh, where a lot of people think meat is really bad for them and they eat it actually it can physically manifest into symptoms and the same with gluten we see it in a lot of clinical trials where if people think they've ingested gluten actually they start to get bloated uh, even if they're having the placebo um so yeah it's kind of a bit of both your body you know might take a little bit of time to get used to it again but also there is that kind of gut brain connection and and people's uh yeah relationship with that food um great jenny's asked a question which i've also heard a lot which is are cooked vegetables just as good as eating raw vegetables or is it best to eat both it really is best to eat both um it all comes back to diversity, not just in the types, but also in how you cook them. Um, because we know that different cooking methods actually, you know, potentially can reduce some nutrients, but also can enhance some nutrients. So things like we know vitamin C in tomatoes is reduced when we cook them, but actually things like lycopene, which is a type of plant chemical, which is really important for skin health, actually, um, actually is enhanced when it's when the tomatoes are cooked. Um, particularly if you add a bit of extra virgin olive oil, a little bit of fat actually increases our body's absorption of the lack of pain so yeah where you can you know one day have it raw next day have it cooked mm. we've had a couple of questions about legumes being difficult to digest and people with different things do you have any advice of different ways of getting fiber or ways to help digest them yeah, I've got a whole section in the book on this um, because a lot of people I see in clinic, um, you know, I say that absolutely. And, and the reason for that is that they're really, really high in these things called prebiotics, specifically called galacto oligosaccharides um, for those who love the science. Um, so essentially these are like, you know, our bacteria's favorite food. And when we eat loads of them, bacteria produce a bit of gas. Now, if you've got a very sensitive gut lining uh, and you have um, the legumes, what happens when that gas is produced, it puts pressure on your gut walls, goes through your gut brain axis, travels up and says you're in a lot of pain or causes and triggers the bloating. So there's a lot of scientific mechanisms at play, but there are many things you can do. And again, I, I talk about more of the details um, of, you know, a step-by-step -step guide, but I also have a sensitive gut menu plan. So it kind of goes, um, it helps people reduce down the prebiotics to start with and then slowly build up. Uh, so that's kind of the best place to start. In more practical terms, it's doing things like triple rinsing your legumes. So when you get a can of beans, because that reduces some of the prebiotic load. Um, so getting the strainer and rinsing them three times to reduce that. And also, you know, starting with small portions, et cetera. Oh, that's fascinating. Vanessa's asked um, a question. She says, does chili affect gut health, which is something that people often say. Yeah, actually, hilariously, I did a post um, on, on social media a couple of days ago about chili. Um, and Absolutely. We think chili is beneficial for the gut. Um, the active component of chili is called capsaicin, uh, and that's thought to help kind of strengthen our gut lining. Um, however, some people are more sensitive to it than others, uh, and particularly people with more, more like sensitive guts with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, 
but I would recommend where you can is to have small amounts and you can train your gut to kind of uh, tolerate that capsaicin because there are health benefits, anti-inflammatory benefits attached to it. So worth including uh, where you can. We've got loads of questions. I'm going to try and get through all of them, but we have a few about um, sort of Nathan's asking about probiotic gummies. You know, is it a waste of money about, um, you know, kefir, about probiotic products, Yakult, things like that. Do they work? Are supplements good? That sort of thing. Yeah, no, I mean, this whole world of, of probiotics. So for those who don't know, probiotics is the live microorganism. Sounds very similar to prebiotics, which we spoke about, but their prebiotics is like the food for the bacteria. Probiotics is a live bacteria. Now, the I understand why there's confusion because one week the media headlines are saying we should all take a probiotic. Next week they're saying they're useless. Um, but the truth, like in many cases, is kind of in between. It's just that our understanding um, of probiotics has been very confused. And, you know, it's important to keep in mind that each different type of bacteria actually does different things in our body. So if you have iron deficiency, you're not going to go and take a vitamin D supplement and expect your iron deficiency to improve, are you? No, they're very different things. So we need to be very prescriptive about our probiotic supplements. And when I was writing my first book, Eat Yourself Healthy, I got my team at King's to review all the different scientific evidence. And we came up with seven areas where there is really quite good scientific evidence to take a specific probiotic. And then we deliver the, the probiotic prescription. So we tell you which type of bacteria or some of them are actually yeast you should take, what dose you should take it at, how long you should take it, and how you should take it with food or without. And, you know, an example is if you have to go on antibiotics for whatever reason, then there's really good evidence to take either Saccharomyces boulardii or Lactobacillus rhamnus GG, two different types. And you would take either or for at 5 billion, 5 billion units twice a day throughout your antibiotic period and for a week after. Now, I know people are probably going, whoa, whoa, whoa just wait, I need to record that down. That's, you know, so therapeutic. But, you know, that's the way we need to treat probiotics if we want the health benefits. There's no point popping any over, you know, on the, the shelves without knowing it's the right one that have sh shown to have a benefit in clinical trials. So you can get that probate prescription um, in Eat Yourself Healthy. Definitely yeah, worth checking out before you invest large amounts of money in a lot of probiotic companies, which are heavy, heavily marketed, but don't have the scientific evidence behind them. Oh, very useful. If anyone missed that, by the way, this talk is recorded. And I know that obviously you can buy the book, the link's in um, the description, but also the recording is going to be sent to you all tomorrow. So if you need to go back and reference. <laughs> uh, we've had a couple of questions now, one from Francis, one from Maggie about leaky gut syndrome. What are your thoughts on it? Does it cause gluten intolerance, et cetera? Yeah. So the thing about leaky gut, um, for those who don't know what it is, so our gut lining, we've, I spoke about that, that nine meter long digestive tract. So in order for the food to get from our gut into our blood, it has to be able to go through the gut wall. Um, and the gut wall is really good at knowing what things it can let into our actual body from our, from our gut into our body. Now with um, leaky gut, it just means that your gut is more permeable. So it means that things from your gut, which probably shouldn't, are able to get through into your body and that can result in low grade inflammation. So what we need to keep in mind is that leaky gut happens in all of us. Uh, from time to time. When we're stressed, our gut gets a little bit leaky, but it's transient. It's short term. It closes back up when we reduce our stress. Um, if we have large amounts of alcohol, our gut gets a little bit leaky. Um, if we have things like celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition to gluten, um, and we eat gluten, then we'll get a leaky gut. So the thing about leaky gut, it's more of a symptom rather than a condition. So for example, with the celiac disease, if you then take out the gluten, then you won't have, your gut will close up. It won't be leaky anymore. If you reduce the stress, your gut won't be leaky anymore. Um, so in some of our clinical trials at King's, we actually measure leaky gut um, uh, pre and post different dietary interventions. Um, but I wouldn't recommend people kind of waste their money in getting all these leaky gut tests. And if someone's told that they've got leaky gut syndrome, I would just be a little bit cautious because um, a lot of... Uh, a lot of unevidence based therapists kind of just say all your problems are because of your leaky gut when actually it's it's not really the case. Okay. Um, going back to kind of 
good food and everything. Um, Sandra's asked about the, you know, ultra processed refined things. How essential for gut health is it to have organic food? Good question. Um, so in terms of the nutrient content of organic versus conventional, we know that actually there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of like the nutrient density. It's more about buying in season is the best thing to do. Um, but this whole new area of, of research is coming through looking at, I guess, the pesticide load between organic and um, conventional. And there hasn't been any robust human studies out there yet um, to show, you know, the size of that impact of having, a, you know, a low grade amount of pesticides from conventional foods. In, you know, well-regulated countries like the UK, you know, even the conventional foods, they do need to get checked for their pesticide load and it needs to, you know, be under a threshold under a marker i know in the us it's a little less strict um so you know what i typically recommend if you can afford it because organic food usually like three or four times the cost if you can afford it and it's not going to reduce down your diversity of plants because we know that access to organic foods can be a bit restricted then hey why not go for it but if it's going to restrict the amount of plants you can eat and the diversity you can eat, then I would absolutely not go organic. Okay, that's good to know. We've had a few questions about drinking on the other side of it. Um, one person's asked, instead of chewing lots, is it good to sort of blitz things up and have smoothies and juices or like, I don't know if they just mean blitz food, but is it okay to, can you ingest things by drinking it? Yeah, no, you can. I would say if you have a more sensitive um, gut, then I wouldn't necessarily rely on on ultra blissed food. So having all your smoothies and everything, because what that can do is dump a lot of the um, pre-digested nutrition kind of into your gut, uh, which can lead to a bit of malabsorption. So I wouldn't recommend having smoothies if if things like bloating are an issue for you. Um, and then you know, and then saying it on the kind of the other on the other hand. Um, we also need to enjoy our food. So if we're just blending everything up, we're not getting all the mouthfeel, the crunch, the texture. Um, so I wouldn't be recommending we just blend all our food to really extract every last bit of nutrition out of those foods. Um, you know, mix it up, I would say. Yeah. Um, Ali wants to know about Coca-Cola, fizzy drinks, that sort of thing. Is it all everything in moderation or can that actually negatively affect your gut health? Yeah, this is a really good one. Um, so this there's a lot of myths around sugar like sugar has been massively demonized um but if we think about the digestion of sugar so it's called sucrose table sugar um actually it's digested very high up our nine meter digestive tract so actually sugar doesn't get to where most of our gut bacteria are so having a bit of added sugar is not going to you know be a toxin or have a negative impact on our gut the reason why we say actually having loads of added sugar is not a good idea is because we end up filling up on these, you know, ultra processed foods and therefore not getting our 30 plant points in a week uh, and not getting that plant diversity in and the whole food. So, you know, with the, the diversity diet, yeah, you can have a little bit of added sugar in your diet. But what I find is if people are focusing on those five principles of, you know, mostly plants, whole, not refined getting in the 30 plant points, actually they don't have loads of room to have, you know, mm. excess added sugars. Ali's response to that is woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> um, a final question is from, um, oh, I've lost it. it. I can't remember the name, sorry about this, but they were asking about drinking water while eating and whether, you know, it dilutes the digestive process. Yeah, I, again, I've got another social post on this probably about two weeks ago um, oh. because this this is a yeah a myth that a lot of people are told, mm. um, and our body is so attuned. And the same with like, are you allowed to have things like dairy and fruit in the same meal? A lot of you know there's some some eating beliefs so that they should be eaten differently at different times because the enzyme release. But actually, uh, the science shows that it doesn't matter for our digestion. Um, one exception to that uh, is if you are suffering with what we call early satiety. So you, you can only eat small amounts and you're struggling to maintain your weight because you're losing weight. Um, then keeping your fluid aside 
uh, not during meal time is probably a good idea because it might just physically fill up your tummy and therefore you're not able to get in the the energy that your body needs on the nourishment. Um, but otherwise, for everyone else, it's free for all. Oh, great. Megan, you've been so helpful. We've had almost 50 questions come in and I think we've got through almost all of them. I think that some people have smashed them together. I hope that's all right with everyone. But you've we've also had lots of people coming in saying how helpful this session has been that they're going to buy your books. They, I mean, you, everyone definitely needs to follow you on socials because you're answering lots of questions there. But this has been so helpful. I think we've you've 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 busted a lot of myths and gave very clear instructions as to how people can improve their gut health and I think a lot of people would be leaving feeling very satisfied and ready to take on their gut health in the new year so Megan thank you so much and congratulations with the release of your book and thank you for such a fantastic talk you're a great you're a great presenter thank you it's an absolute pleasure and I just want people not to go on these crazy diets but to really I guess make the most of this landmark scientific discovery which is their gut health so thanks for tuning in guys Brilliant. Thank you. Have a lovely rest of your evening, everyone. Bye.